And as I've started each of the other two classes, I want to start as well with um, words of a eulogy. Um, I've always seen in Rabbi Lamb four things. There's much more, I'm sure, but I've always seen four things. I've seen in Rabbi Lamb uh, a fantastic scholar um, uh, who prolifically advanced novel ideas with interesting insights in a broad variety of fields. The second thing I always saw in Rabbi Lamb was a religious leader. Um, Rabbi Lamb was uh, a, a, a rabbi who role modeled for us all what rabbis are supposed to be. The third thing Rabbi Lamb was, was a communal leader. Not all rabbis are communal leaders and not all communal leaders are rabbis. Rabbi Lamb was a communal leader, a vision, who was a, a founder and leader of many institutions who saw what things could be that weren't here and built them from the scholarly-like tradition to the more social, like the Mora Shakovil, to the many new and novel things he did at Yeshiva University. He was a builder of that which was new, and he was an expander of that which was already present. Um, finally, as I'm going to say this week in an article that's appearing in the Jewish press, one of the nicest things I saw about Rabbi Lamb, and we're going to discuss this at some length today, is Rabbi Lamb was an intellectual compromiser. He was a person who sought to understand the many different sides of complex issues and frequently lived with that synthesized dialectic tension. Uh, I've grown in the course of my writing about Rabbi Lamb to develop a term for this. Rabbi Lamb was an intellectual diplomat who circled among the various schools of thought and sought to develop compromises among them that were better than the truth of any single one of these positions. Rabbi Lamb thought that the synthesized dialectic tension of multiple views was superior to resolving the dispute by saying this view of mine is correct. The best view was the view that synthesized many different truths in one moment. Rabbi Lamb thought that that compromise was better than starkly resolving the disputes and saying, I think this view is correct or that view is correct. Of course, there's so much of Rabbi Lamb um, that uh, I'm ignoring. I, I got that. Rabbi Lamb was um, a wonderful father. Um, his children said over and over again that they didn't feel that they were growing up in um, the limelight with all of the complexities and difficulties we have of public children, of public parents raising their children. Um, the problem of Rabbeinu Gershon's children was not the problem of Rabbi Lamb's children. Rabbi Lamb was a wonderful father, and I saw with my own eyes how wonderful a husband he was. Um, he once in passing, blessed me that I should have as good a marriage as he did. Um, you know, Rabbi Lamb was a powerful, good person also. But all of this is not what I want to focus on here. Here, I want to focus these 10 classes on Rabbi Lamb's scholarship. I'm not on his communal leadership, not on his religious leadership, not on his being a wonderful person but on Rabbi Lamb's scholarship. He was um, a fantastic scholar. And even after many years have passed and um, the things he did at Yeshiva University will be long gone. Maybe even Yeshiva University will be long gone at some point in the future. Um, the scholarly works that Rabbi Lamb produced will survive and are worth examining over and over again. We don't remember what the Rambam's yeshiva in Egypt looks like. We hardly tell stories about what a wonderful Magid Shir Rashi was. 
we tend to remember for the generations the great scholarship people produced and Rabbi Lamb produced great scholarship. And let me go further than that. It's obvious that it was central and important to who he was because he continued to function as a great scholar even when his communal leadership roles would have allowed him to retreat from scholarship without anybody noticing. Who sees university presidents who remain great scholars? Rabbi Lamb um, was the last of the university presidents who actually published scholarly books while a university president. It's because he perceived himself to be a scholar and he knew that he was on to a legacy of scholarly greatness and accomplishment and that this was at some level, even in Rabbi Lamb's mind, I suspect, more important than his presidency of Yeshiva University or his building of this or his building of that. Rabbi Lamb thought of himself as a great scholar with a certain unique style of scholarship that was really, really, really impressive. Um, last week, we discussed his article on confessions and what an important role it played. I'm sorry. Two weeks ago, we discussed his article on confessions and the important role it played in many different areas. Last week, we discussed his article on ecology. Um, and both of them had in their background the idea that we are owned by God. Today, I want to pick up on a different article that Rabbi Lamb wrote. Um, an article that at the time that he wrote it was of some controversy, which is Rabbi Lamb's article explaining the ideology and practice of the Satmar Hasidim and the Nature Karta. Rabbi Lamb stopped in the 60s to devote his intellectual energy um, to learning intensely the Satmar Hasidim. This is part of his fascination with so with Hasidus in general, but he stopped to focus on great length to explain the intellectual vision and the worldview of the Satmar Hasidim and the Nature Karta. Um, it's a remarkable article, and here you really see the great intellectual Rabbi Lamb. He didn't write this article because he thought if he did a good job, he would succeed the Satmar Rebbe. <laughs> as the Satmar Rebbe. He knew he was ineligible for that job. By the time he published this article, it might have been a glimmer in his eye that he would be the next president of Yeshiva University, but it was not uh, on his agenda that he would be the next Satmar Rebbe, even though by 1970 the Satmar Rebbe was ailing and would shortly pass and had already become mostly dysfunctional. Satmar was in need of a leader, um, but Rabbi Lamb knew it wasn't going to be him. Rabbi Lamb wrote this article, and he says so up front, and he said so to me once 10 years ago, and I've heard him, I've heard other people say it, some of whom found it astonishing, but I get it. Rabbi Lamb wrote this article because he felt it was vitally important to understand what others are doing, to closely examine it for its strengths and weaknesses, to see what valuable good things do they have, what can we learn from their strengths, what can we see from their weaknesses, and what do we gain by examining views that we don't keep. This is Rabbi Lamb at his greatest. And you know that some people nodded their heads negatively when this article came out, that what's wrong with modern orthodoxy, they said, is that Rabbi Lamb is studying Satmar. You don't see Satmar publishing articles on Rabbi Soloveitchik. They ignore their opponents or they belittle them, whereas we take precious, precious space in our leading Torah journals to discuss the ideology of Satmar and to examine their strengths and their weaknesses. And Rabbi Lamb felt very strongly that this was our strength. 
when we encounter an ideology that we don't agree with, we stop to examine it, we compare it to the classical sources, we see what its strengths are, we see how they explain the same information we have, and we learn from that experience. That is the heart of what Rabbi Lamb did throughout his grand intellectual life. He examined his opponents critically, analytically, intellectually, dispassionately, saw what their strengths were, examined their reasoning um, for pluses and minuses, critiqued it, um, incorporated the best there was in our opponents, made it part of our own, and we were stronger because of this. Rabbi Lamb incessantly studied that which he wasn't because he thought we could gain from the study of the other in a deep, profound, intellectual way. We have good things to learn from the study of Satmar. And by the way, at some point in the 1980s, he got himself in a lot of hot water by saying we have good things to learn from studying conservative and reform Judaism. And he said it about a few other things as well, and it's true. Um, Rabbi Lamb's point is, is that what you gain by studying movements that you don't believe in is you get to critically examine your own assumptions, see where you should modify them, see where you're vulnerable to critique, see what attributes your opponents have that you wish you had, and be comfortable acknowledging strengths of others that you wish you had. And say nice things about the virtues of your opponents, because that kind of fierce intellectual honesty should be our strength and not our weakness. Rabbi Lamb writes about Satmar the following words, courage, especially idealistic courage expressed at great personal sacrifice is so rare that even if we disagree with its thesis, it deserves our respect. Listen to the words of deep intellectual respect Rabbi Lamb holds for Satmar Hasidim, people who we profoundly disagree with, who perceive our core value of religious Zionism to be the work of the devil, and who honestly um, spit at us. They spit at us intellectually, and sometimes they spit at us physically. And Rabbi Lamb expresses admiration. These are idealistically courageous people who sacrifice for their beliefs, and it deserves our respect. Let me add that what Rabbi Lamb didn't say, but which we, we know he meant, and which he's expressed at other times, is that virtue is sometimes missing from our community. We like the comfortableness of our ideological beliefs. We don't like ideological beliefs that need to be expressed at great personal sacrifice. And we run away from disagreement. And we seek instead to be well-liked and beloved. And we have a hard time being disliked and unloved. Rabbi Lamb admires Satmar for their idealistic courage. And he's prepared to put in the pages of tradition, which is the closest thing in 1970 we have to a journal of religious Zionism, um, his admiration for Satmar. And yet, Rabbi Lamb is prepared to follow this up with a biting, biting, biting critique of Satmar. He's the first to put in writing, in Hebrew or in English, what's really ideologically wrong with Satmar. And he hammers it in. He points out that 
Zotmer has no choice but to adopt the view that Rambam's letter to the Yemenite Jews is more correct than Rambam's codification of the halacha in the Mishnah Torah. And that that view is um, intellectually wrong, is what Rabbi Lamb says. The Rambam in his epistle to Yemen, as we call it in English, as his letter to the Yemenite Jews struggling in a complicated situation, says a few things about the coming of the Messiah and its relationship to normative Judaism that are best described as in flat out tension with what the Rambam says in both the Mora Nevuchim and the Mishnah Torah. In the Mishnah Torah, the Rambam describes the Mashiach as arriving naturally through a political movement <coughs> that rebuilds the Beis Amigdash by our own hands, by our military might, and through our physical prowess. And this sure looks like religious Zionism. And the Satmar Rebbe says, well, of course it does. But the Rambam retracted his view in his letter to the Yemenite Jewry, what we call the epistle to the, Rem to the Yemenites. And Rabbi Lamb stands up and highlights this and screams out, do you know what that view is? That view is wrong, wrong, wrong. And Rabbi Lamb demonstrates that it's wrong by showing, first of all, when the Rambam wanted to change things in the Mishnah Torah because he changed his mind, he published subsequent editions. So if he really changed his mind after he wrote the Mishnah Torah, he would have published a second edition. And we know of a dozen cases where the Rambam changed his mind. When the Rambam changed his mind, he was intellectually committed to saying, I made a mistake and I changed my mind. Secondly, the epistle to the Emmons was written before he published the Mishnah Torah. So if anything, we're inclined to think the Rambam changed his mind to what's found in the, Mor in the Mishnah Torah and not from what's found in the Mishnah Torah. Third of all, we all know that the Rambam's letters written in Judeo-Arabic to Jewish communities here and there represented aspects of Horad Shah. The Yemenite Jews were in a desperate situation and the Rambam was worried that they were going to trend towards crazy messianism. And thus, we're all inclined to think that the Rambam's epistle to the Ammonite Jews was distinctly not his view. And as Rabbi Lamb points out, if the Rambam's letter to the Ammonite Jewry is not his view, then the basic intellectual perspective of Satmar loses and is finished. And Rabbi Lamb has no difficulty or hesitation critiquing it. And he highlights what other authorities could support the Satmar review. There is a famous Maral Prague that supports the Satmar review. I'll add from my own perspective, there's a famous Tosfus that you could understand as supporting the Satmar review. But Rabbi Lamb's point is, is that even as we were prepared to examine Satmar for their intellectual strengths and weaknesses, we have to be honest not only about their courage, but we have to be honest about the fact that they get the sources wrong on occasion. They're not all right. They're deeply wrong about their read of not some obscure Jewish law authority, Rav Avram in Ahar. They're deeply wrong about the way they want to understand the Rambam. And that's not a small thing. And that's not an inconsequential error. It's a profound mistake um, that they make. And Rabbi Lamb hammers them with it because much as he's committed to examining people who he doesn't agree with, he's simultaneously committed to acknowledging their mistakes. Rabbi Lamb also highlights something that he highlights in a few other places of his writing a tendency in communities to highlight agotic texts as if they're really law. 
Most objectionable, Rabbi Lamb says, is Satmar's misapplication of legal halachic methodology to non-legal agadic texts. Rabbi Lamb's point here, and he says it, by the way, not just about Satmar, but he says it in a different place about something uh, in the religious Zionist community as well, which is we have a strong tradition of, of agadic homiletic learning. We have lots of stories in the Talmud and we study them and we give drashot about them and we ponder them and we consider them, but we don't take them too seriously. And um, these are mental gymnastics. And it's good to be able to do this. And Rabbi Lamb says these are perfectly fine techniques for drashot. And let me add that Rabbi Lamb was a masterful darshan but he says it's important that when you build your ideology of Judaism, you have to build it on mainstream texts that were understood to be law. And the Satmar Rebbe, Rabbi Lamb says, um, tends to highlight non-law texts. And Rabbi Lamb is adamant, and he's very, very, very powerfully correct here. You can't build a religious ideology on Talmudic stories. You can't build them on aphorisms. You can't build them on tales. You can't build them on midrashim. You have to build them on law. And when the Satmar Rebbe says, I have here a medrash, and the medrash here contradicts a tosis, Rabbi Lamb says, you know what you can't do? You can't do that. That's not the way Jewish law works. And Rabbi Lamb calls him out, calls the Satmar Rebbe out a few different times for misapplication, carelessness in his reasoning. This is Rabbi Lamb at his best. Rabbi Lamb is happy to examine positions that he doesn't agree with, but he's ha and he's happy to examine positions he does agree with, but he's an honest broker. He doesn't think that just because the Satmar are sincere or the religious Zionists are sincere, that that makes them correct. Sincerity is nice. Uh, intellectual courage is great, but um, profound learning and reasoning is really, really, really important. And he stops a few different times in a few different places to note that the Satmar Rebbe's learning is weak and that he has some sources to support him. But an honest read of the rabbinic tradition says that the three oaths that the Satmar Rebbe makes so much about are just a corner of the agadic literature and not to be taken so seriously. Um, what Rabbi Lamb says, these sources are never to be imagined as a bona fide avenue for determining practical issues. This critique of Rabbi Lamb, this critique by Rabbi Lamb of the Satmar Hasidim is vintage Rabbi Lamb. He is happy to spend his time examining Satmar and he's happy to learn the good things about Satmar. He sees them as virtuous, but he's also happy to call out their shoddy reasoning and to acknowledge that um, not every statement that the Satmar Rebbe makes is correct. And not only is not every statement correct, some of them are downright implausible and illogical. And the Satmar Rebbe has to be subject to the same intellectual rigor as everybody else. And that your moral courage and the certainty of your conviction is no substitute for your consistency with the classical text. So Rabbi Lamb hammers the Satmar Rebbe 
mightily while conceding the strength of his read of some texts, he frontally takes on the single greatest pillar of Satmar ideology, which is that the epistle to the Emmons represents the final thinking of the Rambam. Um, if Rabbi Lamb is correct, Satmar ideology doesn't work. And Rabbi Lamb is correct, and Satmar ideology doesn't work. This is such an important, important idea. Rabbi Lamb's critique is, of course, there are some who support Satmar ideology in the Jewish tradition, but they're at the margins. He has a wonderful paragraph, and it's one of my favorite um, Rabbi Lamb paragraphs because it says two things, and they're both not only vintage Rabbi Lamb, but they're powerful intellectual statements of what we all should be. The Jewish tradition certainly possesses, here and there, Rabbi Lamb says, a quietistic element, one that was most noticeable in Hasidism, but it certainly does not predominate. The Naturae Karta are incapable of appreciating that the Jewish tradition often embraces divergent views. This is exactly Rabbi Lamb's point. The Naturae Karta, the Satmar, have a set of sources to support them. They're there. There is a Maharal. There is an alternative read of a Tosfus. There, it is there. But Rabbi Lamb's point goes as follows. The rabbinic tradition is wide and deep and contains many different pools, not all of which are of equal validity and equal authenticity. Um, Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein once expressed it to me as follows. He said, all of us have dark closets in our homes with weird ideas. And we have to acknowledge that we're there, but we don't have to parade them around as if they belong in our living room table. Rabbi Lamb says the same thing here. The Jewish tradition certainly does possess here and there a quietistic element. Of course it does, but it isn't front and center. It isn't dominant. It isn't found in the Rambam. It isn't the best read of the dominant view of Tosfus. It's here and there. And when you build your ideology, on a non-dominant, non-central position that's just a here, the, and a, and a there, the, um, that's not an authentic read of the Jewish tradition. That Satmar has occupied um, the dark corner of the third bedroom on the fourth floor of rabbinic Judaism, Rabbi Lamb is happy to concede is true. And there are sources in that closet. But no authentic reader of the Jewish tradition would say that the Maralmi Prague is capable of engaging in profound dialogue with the dominant view of Tosus and the dominant view of the Rambam is found in the Mishnah Torah. When these two ideas agree, they go on the living room table as the Jewish view. When they don't agree, when somebody disagrees with them, you're allowed to have your view. Michael Broyd's allowed to say that I think the Rambam is wrong, but people are allowed to move me into the fourth floor closet and lock the key. Rabbi Lamb's point is, is that Satmar Hasidism has picked up an obscurata in rabbinic Judaism and turned obscurata in rabbinic Judaism into an ideology. And then Rabbi Lamb says something even much more important, which I really, really think is vintage Rabbi Lamb, and which I'd love to make vintage Michael Broid, if only I were smart enough. But the very coherence and consistency of Satmar is an indication of its vulnerability. One need not return to the philosophical criticisms of ideology to feel that the ideology here discussed ignores much of the Jewish tradition and literature, which reflecting life itself possesses ambiguity, ambivalence, 
paradoxes, and more. Rabbi Lamb's point goes as follows. The Jewish tradition is itself made up of grand ideologies which live in contrast to each other. And we stitch together ideologies which are intellectual compromises. And we're not always ideologically consistent because we come from a 2,000 or 2,500 year old intellectual tradition that is not fully intellectually consistent. I don't have to think that the Rambam and Rabbi Yehuda Anasi and Rabbi Moshe Feinstein all agreed about everything. Not true. They didn't agree. And that's okay. But it's important to understand that what Rabbi Lamb here is proposing is the grandest Rabbi Lamb out there, which is we are not ideologically monochromatic and not monolithic. We are a stitched together tradition in the year 1970, Rabbi Lamb says, and Michael Broyd will say in the year 2020, in which we've stitched together the best of Jewish tradition for the last 2,000 years, and we are working on stitching it together like a quilt. It is full of ambiguity, life's lessons, ambivalences, and paradoxes. And that's okay. And that's even good. And let me add, by the way, um, that Rabbi Lamb was not the most fervent Messianic Jew. Um, Rabbi Lamb was an occasional critic of part of the religious Zionist community in the same vein. I heard Rabbi Lamb say, and he says it in writing himself, ideological ideas which profess to know um, what's in God's plan for us in the future should generally be frowned upon and not generally adopted. Rabbi Lamb didn't love the Kiva Moed theory of religious Zionism, that the time has come and the Messiah is shortly arriving, and we know this to be true because we saw it in a medrash somewhere. Rabbi Lamb says the same thing about that aspect of religious Zionism that he says about Satmar Hasidism. This is Rabbi Lamb at his very, very, very best, which is the stark analysis that Rabbi Lamb applies in the 1960s to Satmar Hasidism. Rabbi Lamb soon applies to the religious Zionist fervor of the post Six Day War and onward. Rabbi Lamb is uncomfortable with the idea that um, a single strain of thought found in a medrash somewhere, or even found in some halachic authority somewhere, can become the ideology of our community. We like to go in the center. We like to live in the consensus. We like to have Rambam and Tosfus both supporting us. And we like to stitch them together, taking advantage of their experience, recognizing the ambiguities and ambivalences and valences of the Jewish tradition. And we need to live and learn from that in some real way. At the end of Rabbi Lamb's article, by the way, Rabbi Lamb says this in the most veiled way. He's writing in 1969, but boy, does he see the handwriting on the wall. Let me tell you that Rabbi Lamb was prophetic in the 60s and 70s as to what was going to be wrong with our community. Rabbi Lamb says, writing in, it's published in 1969, so I'm going to guess he's writing in 1968. There may be a time when Israel will be inclined to an inflated view of its own power and prowess, 
its triumphs may, in the nature of things, go to its head, and militarism may someday turn from an unwanted necessity to a way of life. Moses already warned us against boasting that my power and my might have wrought all of this. <coughs> Modern Israel must scrupulously avoid this fallacy, a fallacy which is dangerous not only morally and spiritually, but also politically. The Naturae Carta are irritating reminders that activism can lead to the illusion of total self-sufficiency and self-sufficiency to arrogance and arrogance to presumptiveness. Wow, Rabbi Lamb is writing this in 1968. Um, Rabbi Lamb turns the same ideological rigor that he shares with Sa about Satmar Hasidism to the exact same critique of religious Zionism in the exact same way. Rabbi Lamb believed passionately and powerfully, and he expresses in, his, in this article something that he expresses in many others. The safest place in rabbinic Judaism is in the center. It's the exact opposite of the Kutzker Rebbe's witticism. You know, the Kutzker Rebbe used to have had a witticism, which is the middle path is for the horses. But I never liked it. And Rabbi Lamb hated it. The middle path is for the fine, upstanding, intellectual people who recognize that truth doesn't lie in ideological extremes. It doesn't lie in obscure medrashim. It doesn't lie in occasional ma'amare chazal that are present but are not adopted into the center of rabbinic Judaism. Our goal as we build a community is to live in the intellectual center, the compromise center, Rabbi Lamb says, where we learn from everybody around us and we adopt views that are stitched together from the grandeur of the people around us. You know, I once heard a quip, not from Rabbi Lamb, but it could have been, that there's a Tosus in Beitza, there is, it's true, upon which you could build all of conservative Judaism on. It repeals a rabbinic decree based on changing times. And Tosfa says it in passing. And somebody remarked that on this Tosfa you could build conservative Judaism. And it's important to note that it's true. On this Tosfa you could build conservative Judaism. But Rabbi Lamb's response is as follows. And on this Maralmi Prague you can build Satmar Judaism. But that's not who we are, and that's not what we want to be. We want to be the group of Jews that builds themselves on the firm center occupied by the deep Jewish tradition of the last 2,000 years, the predominant sources that the Rambam inhabits, the Mishnah Torah, the dominant views of Tosfos, the codification of ideology found in the Gedolim, that we are familiar with, that are the mainstream inhabited by the norms of the Jewish community that we live from. When you have to point to me a source that I've never heard of, inhabited by a Jewish authority that uh, I've never really learned, um, Rabbi Lamb's point is that that's not the way authentic Judaism um, is done. Authentic Judaism is done by the predominant sources um, that are found um, everywhere. The Rambam's epistle to the Emmons was written in Judeo-Arabic and lost for many years. It's not an authentic source that you can build a whole movement around. The Mishnah Torah is Hilchos Malachim, is the ideology upon which rabbinic Judaism builds its messianic vision. And our normative non-messianic religious Zionist ideas are well found um, in that Mishnah Torah. That's what Rabbi Lamb says. And I find that to be 
deeply, deeply persuasive. So I've concluded my analysis of Rabbi Lamb here, and you see his two virtues. His sharp scholarship, driven by intellectual compromise. I want to take note again how honored I am um, by some of Rabbi Lamb's children and family joining us. Uh, Shalom is here and Joshua is here. And, and I can't tell you how honored I am um, by that. Um, I, I'm not a big uh, crier. Um, and yet um, I confess that Rabbi Lamb's death um, has made me sad every day for the last 30 days. I feel it mightily in my heart. Um, and I know it's just a culmination of a feeling I had a few years ago that the Lamb era is over and we're not heading to a better place. I worry that the people who have inhabited Rabbi Lamb's shoes can't fit them. They don't fit them. And we're heading into a time and a place where the leadership is simply less. I didn't feel that way when Rabbi Soloveitchik passed and Rabbi Lamb assumed the mantle. Um, Rabbi Lamb was not Rabbi Soloveitchik. At some level, though, he was better than Rabbi Soloveitchik because he was prepared to sort through Rabbi Soloveitchik's idiosyncrasies and discard the ones that were outside the main. I liked Rabbi Lamb more because he was the Rav without some of the Rav's idiosyncrasies. I don't see that so much, and it makes me want to cry. Those who want to unmute themselves and on, uh, I don't know what the proper word for make yourself video appear, I'd be honored and we could sort of go around the room and get comments from everybody and hear what people say. I did post the article on the Zoom chat for those who want to download it. I took it off the Tradition Online website. I'm a subscriber, so I don't know if you can without a subscription. I'm simply not sure. I, as a subscriber, can, and I shared it. I hope that's okay, and I hope I haven't violated Tradition's copyright. I think that they're prepared to let people share, but if not, I very, very, very much apologize. Um, please, if people want to um, video themselves in and comment, I would welcome that. And, um, you be and willing to um, I'd, I'd welcome comments. Please, Blumenthal's. Would you be willing to comment on what uh, you think his view of annexation would have been? No idea. I think Rabbi Lamb would have treated this as a question of prudence and not a question of ideology. Rabbi Lamb wasn't ideological in these matters. When you said to him, um, land for peace, he didn't ask religious questions. He asked, are we going to get real peace? He, he refused to be a religious Zionist ideologue. I think Rabbi Lamb would have said, let's convene a panel of 100 generals and, get, and examine what the 100 foremost national security experts in Israel would think. And I don't think he, Rabbi Norman Lamb would have had an opinion. He would have said, do I have a PhD in Israeli security? That's what the Rav said as well. Do I have a PhD in Israeli security? Like, please, let's convene the experts. If you'd said to him, this is a great idea and it will work, Rabbi Lamb said, I'm in favor of it. And if you said to him, this is a terrible idea and won't work, but will Rabbi Lamb promise us that God will protect us anyway? Rabbi Lamb would have said, no. I will not promise you that. God might not protect you. Don't do that. If it's a bad idea, don't do that. That's what I think. Please, others want to participate? Shalom, it's so good to see you. It's very wonderful to be here. And I, I just want to thank you on behalf of the family. Um, it, it is enjoying this so much. It is so wonderful to hear. It's not just a recitation of uh, articles, it really is an analysis, and it's, it, it's extremely, extremely well done. I'm, I'm, I'm proud, I'm honored, and I'm deeply, deeply grateful. Uh, I, I admire your father so much as a scholar. I, there's so much more, but I want to focus on his scholarship because I know in 500 years, they won't be telling stories about what a good father your father was, even though he was. Which is but more the don't. shame, <laughs> which is a shame. I understand, <laughs> but, but it's just, we don't know anything about how good a father the Rambam was. 
We know nothing about Rabbeinu Tom's parenting skills, but your father's scholarship will survive. And that's just the truth. It, the Rambam might have been a fantastic father. I really don't know. But, but in 500 years, they'll be reading your father's articles. And that's what I want to focus on here.